Right, happy Father's Day. I trust that, you know, through the entire uh, few months, you have become better fathers, seeing that you have been confined to your homes, to your family. It's not a confinement, really. It's a God's way of putting you together with your family so that bonds could have been built. So I trust that you have had a great time and uh, you have, you know, through this whole experience, you have become better fathers. Over the past couple of months or so, I've been, you know, just wanting to say, Lord, I, I thank you for the simple things in life. And uh, I have never in many years now given a special in church. So I thought maybe I'll just give you guys a special. Uh, this is a song that is actually an expression of my heart. And I trust that it will be also an expression of your heart, thanking God for the little things in life. As I struggle alone, they say I have nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart, I'm rejoicing, and how I wish they. food on my table and shoot These clothes, they're not new. I don't have much money, but Lord, I have you. That's all that really matters, though the world may not see. Okay, I trust that the song blessed your heart as it blessed mine. More than that, I pray that it'll become an expression of your heart towards the Lord, thanking Him for all the blessings that He has blessed you with. This morning, I wanted to look for a father that could really challenge our hearts. And uh, I want to speak about the greatest man in the East. And no, 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 I'm not talking about Wong Fei Ho. Right? I'm talking about a father right here from the Bible itself that the Bible calls the greatest man in the East. But, you know, instead of starting from the beginning, I'm going to use the last few scriptures about him. 42 chapters 
And one whole book, that whole book is dedicated to this one man. So I'm going to start with the ending because this is where we all want to be. Listen to this. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life. That's right. I'm going to be talking about Job more than the former part. And it tells us how, how, how much of cattle he had, how many cattle, how many sheep. Everything was double. And then he also had seven sons and three daughters. And then it goes on to say, Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance together with the brothers. They also received an inheritance. After this, Job lived a hundred over years and his family got blessed and his children and his grandchildren. I mean, most of us would like that kind uh, of a life, that kind of an ending. We want to get so blessed by God, everything double. We want the, our, the ending to be far better than the beginning, you know. And, and that's my prayer, that at the end of the day, a good father leaves a good inheritance for his children. His family, are tr his family will be tremendously blessed, not just his family, but, you know, the, the next generations up to the third, fourth generation, they shall be blessed. And you know what the Word of God says? That if we remain faithful to God, up to a thousand generations, God's going to bless them. And we may not see uh, three or four generations, but at least we know that the blessing of the Lord will be there upon them. So uh, this morning, I'd like us to go into the book of Job and start from the beginning and find out how did he become uh, so blessed by God? You know, you can't just take a walk and then wind up on Mount Everest, okay? There, there has to be preparations. There has to be uh, different things that you must go through in order to get up to the top of the mountain. And man, you and I as fathers today, we want to be up there on the top of the mountain. So let me just give you some thoughts, uh, which I, I believe will help you because I'm sure it's, it's, it's going to be my prayer that God would help me uh, become the kind of father he would want me to be, all right? So Job chapter 1, verse verses 1 through verse 5, it says this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys, you know, and I'm sure you're not asking for all those animals, but he's just talking about the blessing of the Lord. And he had a very large household so that this man, Job, was the greatest of all the people of the East, the greatest man of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day and would send and invite the three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So this morning I'd like to suggest a few things uh, that we could see in Job's life how the Bible defines him, okay? This is what God said, Have you beheld my servant, Job, who is perfect in, in all his ways? Well, what a testimony it is when God says something good about us. So the first thing is Job was described as perfect. The Bible says he was blameless. And the word simply means to be pious, to be a complete person, spirit, soul, and, ba and body. He was equally balanced, equally balanced individual. In other words, he made sure that every area of his life was looked after well. He was good with God. God recognized him and he loved God and he spoke to God on a daily basis. He had a good relationship with God. His spirit man was alive. His soul, he was able to communicate so well, not only with the community, which made him a very successful businessman, but also with his entire family. He had this wonderful family all around him. Also, his physical body. He looked after his body so well that Job was 
perfect in every way in that sense, all right? Not in perfection that he did not sin, but perfection in the sense that he was a complete, well-balanced person, blameless. You couldn't find a fault with Job when you spoke to him the way he spoke, the way he did things. And, and you know, this is the prayer I have for my life. And I pray also for you as fathers that they will not find fault with you. You know, they say the best way to describe uh, yourself, if you want to know who you really are, find out what your, your son or your daughter is saying to your friend, their friend about you. What do they say about you when they talk to their friends? That's the most important testimony that we have. That when they see and they say, you know, this is my dad, this is my dad, this is how he's like, you know, and, and this is how he speaks to us, and this is how he behaves in the family, and he's always intellectually growing. He's, he's not just a slob that sits in front of the TV and just all the time watching TV. This man is growing. He reads books. He's, you know, every area of his life, he, he wants to develop it. He exercises to keep himself strong and fit. My dad doesn't just eat junk food. He watches his diet. Come on, guys. I'm speaking heart to heart to you uh, this morning as a father to a father. All right. So in that sense, he was perfect. The second thing about him was he was a promise keeper. The Bible calls him upright. In other words, he was a man of integrity, which meant that when Job said something, when he gave his word, he kept his word. This is so important. You know, when I begin to read Psalm 15, there's a big difference between, you know, an ascending experience because all of us have ascending experiences, which means that when we have trouble, we go up to the presence of the Lord, we kind of seek Him, and then He answers us, and then we come back down, and then when we are in trouble again, we go up, or we have a need, we go up. That's called an ascending experience. But in Psalm 15, it talks about learning to abide in the presence of the Lord. That's where I want to be. I want to learn to abide in the presence of God. Not just to go up when I've got needs, but also to, to be able to stay, remain in His presence. That the songs that come out of my heart and the worship that comes out of my heart would be so real. And I want to live there. I want to live with praises in my heart. Amen. And God wants us to live in, in His presence. And so Psalm 15, one of the things he says is, Here is a man, if you want to live in the presence of God, you've got to learn to give your word and make sure you fulfill it. He who swears to his own hurt. Which means that once you made a promise, uh, even if it costs you something to fulfill it, you've got to fulfill it. Okay? And, and this is who we are meant to be as men, as fathers. What kind of an example uh, would we be if we gave our word and our kids hear us giving our word to someone and then we say, hey, it's not convenient, you know, so uh, never mind, like, you know, the guy will understand me. That's not a good testimony. So we want to be able to be uh, promise keepers, not promise breakers. Amen? The third thing about Job was, he was very perceptive. The Bible says that he had the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is simply understanding who God is. He was concerned that here is God who is watching over me. What was God thinking about me? I'm constantly functioning under the, the spotlight of the Holy Spirit. And so he understood this. That's why he said, I don't know. My kids don't understand this. Maybe they made a mistake along the way that they did not really see. So now what I want to do is uh, I will pray on their behalf. Uh, because they don't walk like I walk. They don't walk under the spotlight of the Holy Spirit. But I can pray for them. But the point is, he lived in that context. Perhaps I have sinned. Now, if he prayed for his children in case they sin, I'm sure he prayed for himself. Constantly watching to see, God, have I sinned against you? Have I gone against you? God, I know that you're watching. He feared. He revered God. And one of the basic things uh, about uh, Father, or any believer is, we must learn to understand the fear of the Lord. In fact, the fear of the Lord is something that can be taught. David said, teach me the fear of the Lord. I want to understand what it means to walk understanding that God is always watching over me, not to punish me, but that He's such a loving, compassionate Father. His eye is on the sparrow, Jesus said. Surely He watches over me. And while I am slumbering in sleep, God watches over me because God does not slumber. The whole idea is that we are living as believers 
Fathers, may I encourage you? We are living. Nobody watches us. You know, they say the test of character is who we are when no one's watching us. Good understanding of character, isn't it? Where we begin to understand that character is who we are when no one's watching us. When no one's, especially those whom we think, you know, might make, a, you know, might, might uh, authority over our life or somebody who is, whom we are a little bit scared of and we say, I hope the guy is not watching. <laughs> well, God is watching. All right. So that's where our character is seen. So he was very perceptive to understand who God is, that God was a loving God. The fear that he had of God is not afraid that God would send him to hell or punish him. The fear that he had of God was, God, I love you so much, and I thank you for watching over me. I can come before you at any time, God, and I know that you will re receive me and forgive me of all my sin. Now, this is pre-Calvary. They had to offer sacrifices in the light of God to receive the forgiveness of God. And Job made sure that there was a sacrifice done. All right. So he was perfect, completely balanced in his life. He was a promise keeper. He was perceptive, but he was also a very prayerful person. That's what I talked about when I mentioned uh, him praying for his children. And it says this in, in verse 5, it says, this he did regularly. It's not like bring them to church once a week and hopefully the pastor will pray for them and uh, elders will pray or take them to a cell group and ask people to pray. You know, I was talking to, to, to my wife, uh, Pastor Lifan, and I was saying sometimes we remove from you the privilege that is reserved strictly for you. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we say, well, let me pray for you when actually you should be praying yourself. See, we have the same thing. Someone just sent me a little text and said, Pastor, from another uh, church, and, and he had a little bit of a problem, and so he, he sent me a little text. He said, Pastor, can you pray for me? I said, of course, I'll pray for you. But I also said to him, now listen, God loves you as much as he loves me. Sometimes you feel, oh, if the pastor prays, then God will answer. No, 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 no. If you pray, God will answer. Job didn't have like a pastor. They, they, he didn't have anyone around him, man. In fact, the best friends he had, the four friends he had with him were not very good guys. They, I mean, they were wonderful uh, people, very wise people. But, you know, when he had a situation, Job learned to pray. The success of Job at the end of the chapter, which I started off with, is based upon his regular contact with God. Why can't you not understand? Sometimes I want the church to understand. I've said this so many times. My job is to get me out of a job. Why? Because I want you to be able to search the scriptures yourself. Hear from God yourself. Receive an anointing of the Holy Spirit upon yourself in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever you are. When you pray, you can sense the presence of God and receive an infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit wants you to know He wants to become so close and intimate with you. That's why I close almost every Sunday. I say the same thing. May the communion and the fellowship and the intimacy of the Holy Spirit be with you. Be with you. So Job was a prayerful person. Fathers, I pray uh, that you have already learned over the past couple of months that you pray. Don't just pray, God, that my job might be secure, but rather, God, make me secure in your presence. Don't just say, God, bless my family. Tell him, ask him. See, we receive not because we ask. I mean, I can go down this road and talk about prayer for, for hours. Uh, the main thing is for you to understand that God really wants to be your best friend, to help you. He's your king. He's your Lord. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or imagine. The success story of Job lies in the fact that he was a prayerful person, a prayerful person. In chapter uh, 42, verse 10, Job began to intercede for his friends, and God restored his fortune and then doubled it. Can you see that? Job interceded. So it's tied in the doubling, the restoring ties in with his ability to pray, the ability to intercede, not just for himself, but for his friends. In fact, the Lord was upset with his friends and said to him, Job, uh, 
you know, all you guys go to Job, let him pray for you, and you guys will get healed, which meant that something began to start affecting them. And so the Bible says when Job prayed for them, they all got healed, and Job interceded for his friends. God restored his fortune when he started to pray for somebody else who kind of like, didn't really have it all together. They were they, they had their businesses. They had their families. Job could have said, well, how can I pray for them? I'm the one who needs prayer. But yet he said, you know, I'm going to intercede for you guys in that pain, in, in the, in the uh, uh, bankruptcy that he had just gone through, the sickness in his own body. You know, all these things was affecting him. And yet the Bible says he prayed. Oh, I pray. God, help me to be like Job, you know. I may not measure up to where he's at, but God, help me. Help me. At least I will know to pray in the moments of, of pain, the moments of loss, tragic loss and disease upon his body. Lord, teach me to be like Job. Help me to be prayerful. Amen. And, and another thing about Job was he was very patient. Listen to what James says. James chapter 5, verse 11. You know we call those blessed. The word blessed means happy, spiritually prosperous. I'm, I'm taking from the uh, Amplified Bible. We know we call those blessed, happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God, who were steadfast and endured difficult circumstances. Why were they happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God? Because they were steadfast and endured difficult circumstances. You have heard of the patient endurance of Job. <laughs> and you have seen the Lord's outcome, how he richly blessed Job. The Lord is full of compassion. The Lord is merciful. But you have heard of the patient endurance of Job. You have seen the outcome when God begins to bless. James 5, 11, the same thing. King James Version or other versions will say, you have heard of the patience of of Job, how when he went through it all, he did not curse God. He came up with a statement that we use as a song, you know, that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the word of God says in the book of Job, oh, in all these things, Job did not sin with his mouth. Instead, he used his mouth to bless the Lord and praise him and honor him and give him praise, give him glory. In spite of all this, Lord, I don't understand. I've lost everything. And I'm hurting like crazy. He had to use broken pots to cut his, his flesh because of the pain, the agony, the itch that, that he was going through. And yet, in spite of it, he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He endured it because he knew that all things were working out together for his good. Friends, I pray that this kind of confidence will reach into our hearts, your heart, into my heart. God will fill us with this confidence where we will say, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. I will trust you, God, in spite of all that I am going through. I am praying this. I am praying, God. God, give me this kind of, of, of faith, this kind, uh, raise the level of my faith that when I go through the most difficult of times, I will say, Lord, I will refuse to curse your name, but I will lift up my hands and I will bless you at all times for you are worthy to be praised. The Lord has given. It is his right to take away. I will bless the Lord at all times. Amen. Amen. Even he was so patient with his friends patient with his wife, you know, and, and uh, the, the result is tremendous. It says in Job 42 and verse 11, at the end of the day, man, it looks like his brothers and sisters had not come to his house for quite some time from this uh, scripture because when he was going through all the suffering, man, none of them were near him. That's where you can tell your own friends, right? Uh, when you are going through a really difficult time in your life, you need good friends. These guys came, and of course, they, they were good guys. I mean, they just sat and, and they watched him. They were in silence for a long period of many days. They just sat there silently just looking at Job. They didn't want to just start talking and giving him advice. Of course, the advice they gave later on was not too good. But look at this scripture. Suddenly, all his brothers and sisters 
Where would they when, when Job was going through the trouble? That's not the point. The point is they came to his house and they celebrated. They told him how sorry they were. Why? Job, we're so sorry, man. When you lost all your everything else, we thought, what can we do to help you? We might as well stay away. I don't know what their reasons were. You know what? Thank God for cell groups. I pray that you belong to a cell group. You know, cell groups are so important. Over the past few months, you guys have been connecting with one another, talking to one another. That's family. We are family. When somebody goes through a trying time, man, we, we must be there for them. And, and when we pray for them, I mean, not just say, God bless them, but we got to really intercede. If it is your loved one, if it's your son, if it's your daughter, if it's your wife, your husband, man, you really intercede. And that's family. And when people in our church go through difficult times, we've got to stand with them and pray and intercede that God would richly bless them. Listen, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's the spirit of intercessory prayer. And the moment you put your heart into a prayer for someone, He's going to help you to pray for them. It's difficult sometimes, especially where were the brothers and sisters when you really needed them and you thought, hey, forget it. But they came in, they asked for forgiveness. Job welcomed them. He had an open door. That's why they could come. He could have just shut the door. Brothers and sisters coming. Where were you guys, man, when I really needed you? Shut the doors. But no, Job opened the house so that everybody could celebrate in the goodness of the Lord. That's what we are supposed to do. Have open door open house to people so that they can come in and celebrate uh, with us. They, they, they were sorry. They consoled him for all the trouble that God had brought him. I don't know what they said, but anyway, each one of them brought generous housewarming gifts. Isn't that what we... That, I like that part. I like that part. If you can't pray for me, at least, you know, uh, bring me a gift. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, but it, the point is, we, we, they, they were able to be uh, welcomed by Job. He had such a, a, a wonderful, wonderful heart. Uh, I mean, I, I, I pray God make me like this. Make me more forgiving, more patient with the ones that have hurt me so badly. Because at the end of the day, my trust is in God. Not in whether people bring housewarming gifts, generous or not. I mean, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is, God, you have blessed me. How can I not bless other people? How can I not welcome them? Amen? Fathers, may we take encouragement from Job. The last thing about Job was he received a place of permanence. One whole book, 42 chapters dedicated to the greatest man in the East. That's something, a big book. It's called one of the greatest pieces of poetry in history. A man who went through tremendous suffering. It's called the, uh, the, the greatest poem in all of history. And there's something. Here is this place. He received a place of permanence. Recorded, quoted by different uh, people. Even Jesus talked about him. James talked about him. Different uh, people begin to use. Job is the number one example of how we've got to go through even the most cr uh, terrible crucible a fire of, of trials, and yet come out of it blessed by God, a testimony for His glory. All of us will face trials. In this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Go through it. James says, I count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials and testings. I tell you, it's a bit difficult, but let's take heart from Job's life. And say, God, I want to be the kind of father Job was. At the end of the day, God blesses him again with children. Why? Why did God just bless him with his business? I mean, you've already had seven, uh, uh, ten children. They're gone. All right, start a new life, Job. You're getting on in years, you know, kind of thing. But God, get, because he had a heart for, for his children. He had a heart for children. I lost my children, but God, uh, I, I want to have my own children. And God blessed him again. Ten children. And children. That an amazing story, but it's not just a fable. It is the actual story of a man that lived in the presence of God. You and I can be that man too. So I want to say, let's take courage. Let's take heart from Job's life. And God 
use the story, may he use the story to encourage us and lift us up in our spirits. Amen. Have a great Father's Day. Let me just bless you as we begin to close. Let me pray for you at first, and then I will give you the blessing. Father, I am so grateful for every father and in every household. I stand in my own household and I say thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. May that be a song also for every father who's watching this program. May they be able to thank you for the little things of life. But yet at the same time, Lord, I've not, not walked into the corridors of their home, so I do not understand where they are at. And I pray that you will encourage them. I thank you so much that you sent us the Holy Spirit, who is the greatest encourager, greatest comforter, someone who can walk alongside us and pour the love of God into our hearts, letting us know God loves me in spite of all that I'm going through. Some fathers are really battling, Lord, and, and they need your grace so much. So I pray for them, especially on this Father's Day. Father, encourage their hearts. Holy Spirit, invade their hearts. Invade uh, the recesses of their minds and, and begin to work on them, letting them understand, have an understanding, an enlightenment that you love them so much. You even offered your son as a sacrifice for their sins. With that in mind, I pray, Lord, a special blessing upon all the fathers today as they celebrate Father's Day. How wonderful you are, our Heavenly Father. How wonderful you are, our Heavenly Father. Drop a little bit of your Father's heart into all our hearts today as we celebrate Father's Day. In Jesus' name, amen. Lifting up your hands before the Lord. So may the Lord so bless you and keep you cause his face to so shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you. Give you peace in all your homes and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the blessed communion, fellowship, intimacy of the Holy Spirit be with you in Jesus' name. Have a great week all week. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this week. I hope to see all of you next week. I pray you have a fantastic week ahead and happy Father's Day. See you.